My name is Georgia Moosey. I'm the president of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. A very warm welcome uh, to all today to Symposium Session 3, one of our series of events um, for the Academy's 51st Annual Symposium this week. We were generously welcomed to country on Monday via opening video sent to all delegates by Mr Wally Bell, an elder of the Ngunnawal people, traditional custodians of the Canberra region and the lands on which the Academy of the um, Australian Academy of the Humanities is based. I join you today from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people joining us today. We are using a webinar format, which means that only the panelists will be seen on screen for this session. Attendees can post questions throughout the session on the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We will take some questions towards the end of the session, but feel free to post a question at any time. We may not have time to get to all the questions, but we would certainly like to hear them. Participants can also follow the discussion via Twitter at HumanitiesAU and hashtag AAH Symposium. Should you encounter any technical difficulties, please contact the Academy via events at humanities.org.au. We will endeavour to deal with any technical difficulties that arise during the session, but if we encounter a major technical failure, and cannot fix it in a timely manner, we will advise all delegates. The session is being recorded, so we will reschedule the session and post the recording to our um, YouTube channel. So the focus of today's session is on the work of a new approach, the independent think tank championing investment and return in arts and culture, and how the various reports produced by ANA, um, by, by the ANA research program, can be used to shape a rich and relevant cultural and creative future for Australia. The Academy is, uh, has been delighted to have partnered with the Maya Foundation, the Tim Fairfax Family Foundation and the Kia Foundation to establish ANA with the Academy. Um, and it's been its home here uh, to, the, to the program um, for its first three years. We're extremely proud of what we have been uh, able to achieve at, in this time um, and where the Academy has incubated the AHA program. ANA's aim is to strengthen bipartisan business and wider community support for arts and culture through a truly independent and non-partisan approach. And to do this, we are focused on fostering a more robust discussion about cultural policy one which is based on an evidence-based approach using data and highlighting diverse benefits to the nation of arts and cultural activity. ANA has delivered a series of five outstanding reports which have provided a rich source of information for the cultural and creative sector and for policymakers, uh, which are the focus um, uh, of the discussion today. They examine a broad range of issues related to the creative and cultural sector, including why and how public funding and private investment decisions are made, public attitudes towards arts and culture, and current and potentially new approaches to public and private investment in cultural activity, as well as assets and programs, uh, program consequences and costs of under investment in the arts and the culture. I'm delighted to, um, to be joined today by some of the key members of the ANA team. Uh, Rupert Meyer, the chair of the reference group, Malcolm Gillies, the chair of the research working group and Kate Fielding, program director. As, a K, as Academy president, I chair the ANA steering committee. I'm also enormously delighted to be joined by Ros Abercrombie, regional arts Australia's uh, executive director and, Fr and Francesca Valmore Dia, Dia, Municipal Association of Victorian Arts and Cultural Policy Advisor, to provide some very important sector perspectives on the issues and options raised in the ANA reports. So in this session, Policy Matters, Key Insights from a New Approach, the questions we'll be looking at are, how does arts and culture sit within the broader Australian creative economy? What changes in the arts and culture landscape have been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic? 
why is understanding the perceptions of governments and other stakeholders crucial to the future of arts and culture in this context? And how can arts and culture plan, uh, a plan help Australia's cultural and creative future? So um, my opening remarks now will be followed by a short film, um, which I'll turn over to um, Francisca to um, show us. So over to you. essential service, which is why Victorian councils are the backbone of our creative state. have nourished us during the lockdown and will reconnect us when restrictions ease. Let me live, let me live, let me live, let me live, let me live. Says he still loves you. Thanks very much. Um, um, and so I'll now invite uh, each of the speakers to make uh, a five minute comment. Um, each of our speakers are being restricted to a sh very short, uh, very short commentary. So um, I might begin actually um, perhaps with you Rupert um, as the chair of the reference group. Uh, so I'll just turn to Rupert Meyer now for his five minute comment. Well, look, uh, thank you, Joy, and uh, good afternoon, delegates. What a, what a great video lead in to this session. Um, that we are having a conversation right now about, about what makes a good cultural policy should not, should not be a surprise to any of us. Yes, there is a COVID imperative, and that makes it more urgent. The stakes are even higher. But before COVID, there was a critical conversation that we needed to have. A new approach was founded the, on the belief that cultural policy settings matter a great deal. The data and evidence that's been produced in the five reports make a compelling case for a national approach to cultural policy. The enabling legislation for our nation's national cultural institutions comes closest to enshrining key settings for our Commonwealth government's role in national cultural policy. At the heart of each respective act of parliament is a stated ob obligation for the Commonwealth to fulfill its custodial responsibilities to treasure the nation's cultural assets on our collective behalf. That custodial role is very evident to those appointed to serve. Necessarily though, these institution by institution obligations sit isolated from each other and beyond the custodial role, the component parts are lacking a binding cohesion. The fulfillment of a nation's shared cultural destiny requires something greater with an imperative to anticipate, evolve, innovate, act dynamically and collaborate. Australia is awash with versions of cultural policies. It's been a growth industry. From our three tiers of government around the country, there are plenty of significant and affirming arts and culture policies that aim to develop and support the arts, culture and heritage by building frameworks, making commitments, encouraging excellence and providing access. All of these are in the name of creating thriving social, cultural and economic futures. Invariably, there are specific references to pieces of cultural infrastructure, grants management, access to strategic advice, policy development, regulatory oversight and stakeholder engagement. These are important and necessary precursors. They become even more important if part of a national plan. However, 
we lack a recital that speaks to the criticality of a national approach. And many of the policies are couched in terms of the instrumentalist benefits and not sufficiently in terms of the cultural benefits themselves. There's an awkward reality that Australia doesn't have a confident, assertive national cultural policy with settings to match. Converting evidence into belief has been a key area of focus for a new approach. In the work of the reference group, particularly sharing our own beliefs has been central to how we have worked. And then these personal convictions have been woven into the reports. Using evidence, sharing beliefs, speaking with conviction. At a recent exhibition opening in Darwin, I said, it's a simple proposition. Creativity is good, it sharpens your focus, your thinking and your experience of the world. The arts are not just about entertainment and what you do in your spare time. The creativity of artists drives our own creative abilities and processes. We each get to lead a bigger life. We become part of a larger nation with an expanded sense of itself. In an article for the online research publication, Nitro, entitled Four Memos to Myself, Things I've Known, Wish I'd Known, Have Learnt, Unlearnt, or Forgotten, I wrote, culture evolves over time and is fragile, especially as dominant cultures can overwhelm smaller communities and their cultures. Ours is not a derivative culture of another place. Ours is a cultural democracy in which the ideas of many are simultaneously combined. These ideas give us a shared cultural memory, a pride in what has gone before, an anticipation of what might lie ahead, and a community of common destiny. The ideas of many illuminate cultural heritage and inspire us to action. They nudge us towards coexistence, integration, and cultural transmission. They shift our boundaries, grow our relationships, and give multiple meanings to our personal and community identities. They exert an influence over all, all and cajole us and charm us into thinking deeply about these matters. That is their power. They contribute mightily to explain us to us and us to others. So central to the recommendations emerging from the work of a new approach is the creation of a national arts and culture plan that identifies the enduring and nonpartisan principles and, and responsibilities that could inform more coherent arts and cultural policy settings and investment at all three levels of government. In support of this, a new approach used our opening remarks to the parliamentary inquiry last Friday to progress this agenda and said, there is an opportunity that this inquiry has to lead a process of change in how we can truly thrive as a nation, cultivate our cultural power, exercise our cultural confidence, and elevate our current public policy settings to develop an even greater economic and social force across our creative sectors from which we can all benefit. Thank you, Joy, back to you. Thank you, Rupert, for those wonderful words. And um, yes, there'll be many aspects of that five minute talk that we'll pick up in discussion, I'm sure. Um, so to our next speaker, over to Francesca. Thanks, Joy. Thank you. I join you from Bunurong land in Victoria today and pay my respects to any elders who join us here. Um, until the end of October, I was working in the policy and advocacy area of the MAV, which is a membership association and the legislative peak body for local government in Victoria. I worked as the living embodiment of Action 37 of Victoria's Creative State Strategy which was a, a four-year partnership between the MAV and the state government. Unfortunately, there's no policy around local government or how it could work with state government on the common aim of supporting creative industries growth, just the articulated aim for general improvement in the strategy. So when you consider local government makes up around 30% of creative sector recurrent and capital expenditure, the lack of a policy that goes beyond acknowledgement, acknowledging the important role local government plays in the broader Australian creative economy represents, for me, a lost opportunity. Increasingly, no one on this panel, um, sorry, interestingly, no one on this panel is a policymaker. Um, government 
drafts policy, but what we can all do is influence it. And for this, information is key. And this is where the value of ANA's recent work um, has come into play. Government and especially councils, peak arts associations, cultural institutions and education bodies all use policies to develop relevant strategies and to argue or bid for budgets. So when you work at the local level, as councils do, you realise that good policy is functional, evidence-based, communicates the common objectives of its authors in layman's language and is user-focused. And I suggest good policy is an enabler and clearly explains its purpose, the gap it's trying to fill or the contemporary need it's trying to meet. It's about providing meaning behind intent. And this is what Victoria's local government set out to do earlier this year. The MAV, along with senior local government officers, developed a position statement for the arts, culture and creative industries. This statement needed to represent the views of 13 different board members representing 12 fairly unique metro interface and regional and rural regions be acceptable to 79 council CEOs and able to be supported by 79 councils across the state. This inaugural statement for the arts also needed to stand the test of time. It was the first one and MAV was founded in 1879. It also needed to adapt to this fast changing environment we found ourselves in. And so the statement was considered by its makers as a start point, not an end game. And, the, and hopefully will lead to a robust policy that facilitates all stakeholders. This statement was endorsed along with the video you saw at the beginning of the session by the MAV board and has been used by councils across the state since to build a case for funding and explain how arts programs can be leveraged to improve community life and economic activity. And the other document I worked on this year was ALGA's Arts and Culture Policy Position. ALGA's the Australian Local Government Association and represents um, seven local government associations. The document needed to represent the views of eight different presidents and be acceptable to eight association CEOs and adopted by 537 councils across this huge and diverse country. I'll put the statements in the, um, I've sent them to Ashley, so you can have a look at them yourselves. The position was deliberately broad to incorporate the needs and cap capabilities of the different states and territories around Australia and the diverse communities they represent. Australia's six states and two territories are all unique with different governance models, populations and demographics, funding arrangements, cultural foci and geographical conditions and it was the first policy in its 75 year history. Some of the questions posed by this topic are nicely addressed by an astute observation made by a local government association colleague and indicate why policy is important. To provide context, the Australia Council is planning for the future and recently held a number of town hall discussions, conducted online surveys, sector specific meetings and in one of the many consultation sessions, my, consul my colleagues suggested that the creative sector might like to think about how hard it is to consult them. The arts and cultural sectors are diverse, far, far flung and in some areas fractured. So how can creatives ensure that the sector doesn't get put in the too hard basket by government? So perhaps policymakers might like to take ALGA's national position and build a national arts and culture and creative plan. Thank you very much, Joy. Francesca, that's fantastic. Some great comments there and uh, many illuminating points you make. So we'll pick those up again in our discussion. Thank you. So our next speaker is Kate. Kate Fielding, over to you, Kate. Thanks, Joy. Hi everybody, how are you doing? So glad to be here with you today. I'm coming to you from the land of the Ngunnawal people here in Canberra and would like to acknowledge the long and deep history of culture and creativity in this country. It's one of the uh, very rich parts of our heritage and the joy that it is to be part of this place. 
Now I'm going to, having had that beautiful introduction from Joy about the work of a new approach, I'm going to talk about three of those five reports that she referred to. I'm going to, of course, tell you a little bit about what they cover, but I'm also going to kind of put them in context. The intention with these, the release of these reports is of course to gather data and evidence, but it's to release it in a format that, format that assists with insight, that assists with public policy insight. So today, I'm gonna to give you a brief overview of some of those findings, but with each, I'll then tell you how it is being used, how we're being told it is being used. So I'll begin with uh, impacts. So transformative is the uh, name of the report, which I think is an accurate uh, name, transformative impacts of culture and creativity. Now, this is the, uh, the compendium of material that I wish I had had for the last 15 years. And indeed, it prioritizes work that has been released in the last 15 years that talks about the positive impacts of artistic, cultural and creative activity on seven different aspects of our lives. They are society and place, economy, innovation, health and well-being, education and learning, international engagement and culture, that intrinsic value that Rupert was referring to early. Her. And in this work, uh, we really mapped the current evidence in terms of the positive impacts in those, um, those seven different areas. And what we're seeing is it's being used widely, uh, particularly by state governments. Uh, they're using it to inform their budget bids. They're using it to inform the roadmaps and the strategies that they're releasing. Uh, cultural plans that are, um, that are being prepared by local governments, they're pulling on that material to help uh, provide evidence for their claims in the, uh, in the way that these activities create positive impacts in our communities. It's also being used in our cultural diplomacy space. Now, I'll move quickly to our next report, which is a very exciting one called Behind... Oh, sorry, not that one. A View from Middle Australia, Perceptions of Arts, Culture and Creativity. Now, this, um, this piece re takes a very specific... Looks at the views towards arts and culture from a very specific cohort in Australia. It looks at the views of middle Australians who were defined as swing voters from suburban and regional areas, predominantly in marginal federal electorates. They're middle income, middle aged, and we chose a, uh, had a demographic that was not representative, but re closely related to uh, the cultural mix in Australia but we took a very specific narrow cohort and did a deep dive into understanding what this particular cohort think about arts, culture and creativity. And I'm sure many on this line have heard, uh, that, was, that was a focus group based piece of research, that there were some really clear themes out of that, that middle Australians are clear and vehement, table smackingly vehement, about the value of arts and culture in their lives. They believe arts and culture bring us together. They especially welcome events and experiences that they can enjoy with their friends and family, but also those that extend them to their extended community, the people in their place who they don't necessarily know. And that they see there's incredible value for children in being exposed to arts and culture. Now, for many people, this may, these these insights may not be a surprise in terms of this being things that people value, but being able to demonstrate that this very specific cohort see these particular values in arts, culture and creative activity has been incredibly useful in a number of spaces. Uh, it's been very useful in making the case for investment and relevance of arts, culture and creativity for this cohort who have particular relevance in political discussions we know that it's being used in programming discussions with arts and cultural organisations and local governments who are thinking about how they can look at their programming over the next few years to, to better engage with this specific cohort. And we also know that it's been um, influential in policy and investment discussions. Now I'll talk about what I think of as the Maya Briggs report, behind the scenes, drivers of arts, 
drivers of arts and cultural policy settings in Australia and beyond. This piece of work looks at the four policy drivers that we've identified have really shaped policy, arts and cultural policy around the world and in Australia over the last 75 years. It's important to state that it takes as a starting point as given that arts, culture and creativity has an intrinsic value. That's not what this is about. This is about what we see as what we can see that the, the themes in the cultural policy settings, the policy drivers, the things that have driven action around the world and in Australia over that period. There's four of them. And they are collective identity, reputation building, social improvement and economic contribution. And Malcolm, one of our latest speakers, will speak on that fourth, uh, that's fourth topic, economic contribution. Now, I talk about it as the Maya Briggs of report because it helps you understand the motivations of other people. If you've ever done that Maya Briggs thing where you understand your own type and then you understand the type of the person opposite to you and how you might need to change the way that you communicate to both of you to find common ground. I find this really useful in thinking about policy discussions and, and participating in policy discussions to understand the motivations of other people who are in this space who are thinking about taking action and understanding what those drivers are. We know uh, that that's been incredibly helpful in those types of spaces. Now, as Rupert has referred to, and Francesca as well, we have been talking about the need for a National Arts, Culture and Creativity Plan modelled on Sports 2030. And that, among other things, would articulate and perhaps harmonise uh, the actions and responsibilities of the three levels of government to help unleash the broad range of public and private benefits that a rich cultural and creative life for Australia can and will generate. And certainly, I think uh, Rupert has referred there to the current parliamentary inquiry into creative and cultural industries and institutions. Uh, we gave evidence there last week. And I wanted to share in this forum that I was really heartened by that experience. I know that sometimes uh, I've, I've given evidence before to inquiries where kind of felt like the people in the room were more interested in talking with each other or perhaps sniping at each other um, than, than actually listening to the evidence that was being given. This is not that type of inquiry. The conversation, the questions and the tone was non-partisan. These were people from across the political spectrum asking constructive questions about value for their constituents and relevance for their constituents. This is a really hopeful moment for cultural policy settings at a national level in Australia. Now, I'm sure that we're going to discuss all this and more over the day. So I'm gonna hand back to Joy and looking forward to uh, questions and conversation. Thank you. Great, Kate. Thank you so much for that. And glad to hear of your optimism. This is a wonderful platform from which to move forward. So thanks, Kate, for those remarks. Our next speaker is over is Roz. So Roz, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Joy, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm connecting from Wurundjeri country, and I'm with the Kulin Nations, and extend my respects to all First Nations lands in which we're connecting. So I'm the Executive Director of Regions Australia, and Regions Australia RAA, as we like to be referred to, um, is a not-for-profit peak body that is the national voice for arts in regional Australia. And we seek to ensure that arts and creative industries are recognised as essential across multiple policy platforms and agendas. And, and we've seen this year through several reports that the arts and creative industries <clears throat> play a critical role in the makeup of future livable regions and are central to thriving and healthy communities, looking at sustainable growth across regional, rural and remote Australia. We've seen this through the Australia Council's Creating Our Future report published in August 2020 um, that stated that 98% of Australians engage in the arts in some way through the new approaches, um, 21st century guide, which presented the economic value and contribution to GDP of the cultural and creative sector. And for the Regional Australian Institute's briefing note, understanding regional livability, suggesting that lifestyle and opportunity, which includes cultural and creative activities, is one of the six indicators of livability. 
We've also seen that regional Australia has been hard hit by drought, bushfires, floods, and now COVID-19. We've seen a loss of income, reduced capacity, restricted movement, um, and digital connectivity, all, all colliding as we navigate. Regional Arts Australia delivers a series of programs and research. We also manage the Regional Arts Fund, also affectionately known as RAF, on behalf of the Australian government. Um, in all, April 2020, um, we welcome the announcement from the Morrison government that the RAF would receive a $10 million recovery boost to assist regional artists and regional arts workers and organisations affected by the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, it's important to mention that the recovery boost is delivered through the mechanisms of the RAF, which is a devolved funding program managed by RAA, but importantly coordinated by state and territory um, program administrators. So it's a nationally managed program, but implemented locally. It's place-based, industry-led, and it's proven that it's efficient and effective in how it's demonstrated to be able to be responsive to and adjusting to needs and be able to scale to delivery. Um, the program moves from relief to recovery to renewal, so it's three stages, and the relief rounds um, opened nationally on the 1st of July and is now closed and we've supported 236 projects, which is immediate response to COVID. Um, the network's experienced enormous response to the programs and unprecedented, the overused word, I didn't want to use it, but unprecedented demand on that program. And we've actually distributed 6.5 times what we'd normally distribute for our quick response program. So it's extraordinary what the, the need is. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the time is right for the arts and creative industries to take a lead role in regional development. And regionally, there's a diversity of experiences and a diversity of narratives that we need to understand. There's not just one relationship, there's multiple relationships between artists, audiences, participants, communities, venues, organizations, etc. There's a broad creative ecology that has high spillover effects into other industries in terms of total output, value adds, multipliers, especially seen in tourism and hospitality. And it's important for us in, who are working across policies to look at those partnerships between the three tiers of government, between federal, state and local, across industries, across multiple profits and businesses, that are all critical in leveraging that support and championing the regional arts sector beyond the regional arts sector. At RAA, we see our role as a connector to facilitate the parts of this creative ecosystem that is interconnected and that works across all art forms, across communities and across landscapes. We see that that essential connection um, requires arts and creativity to be included in regional policy. Um, we look at the Morrison government's regional policy, we see that there's portfolios around digital connectivity, education, employment, health services, drought relief, tourism and agriculture, water and environment. All of these have, have access to arts and creative, creative industries, arts and culture being connected to all of those policies in a cross industry approach. And that, jumps into with the previous conversations that people have mentioned around the need for a national arts and culture creativity plan, which allows for a shared vision, for participation targets, for partnerships and opportunities of investment to be integrated in a broad policy conversation. And we see that conversation to be um, embedded in long-term investment in a whole of ecology approach that looks at cultural infrastructure that absolutely connects to small to medium organizations that is place-based and that is artist-led in its delivery. And they're fundamental keys for Regional Arts Australia. We also see that there's an absolute need for equality of access to resources and services. And as we've seen the sector pivot um, and the, the platform of which we're on today in a digital space, there is not equal access to digital um, connectivity across the country. We need to look at digital connectivity, digital scaffolding to ensure that resources and services are equal regardless of geography. And on, in, within the context of digital, also to look at training and education and to ensure that those platforms, um, again, are equal for all to access regardless of the geography or the location. We see that we must work alongside our First Nation colleagues to support their communities, their knowledge systems and their landscapes across Australia and that we continue to work together to support a creative ecosystem that is constructed, contested and reimagined. And that is part of a continuum that looks at and supports creative capacity, community capacity and economic capacity in a regional policy. Thank you. That's right. I look forward to speaking soon. Thanks, Roz. That was fantastic. And thanks for highlighting particularly the regional but other aspects as well, like equity and access, very important. All right, so our final speaker is Malcolm, Malcolm Gillies. So Malcolm, I'll turn to you. Thank you very much, Joy. 
I'm also speaking from the Ngunnawal lands here in Canberra, and I pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'm now going to present five personal insights arising from my recent and very enjoyable work with the research working group of a new approach. My first point, policy. A new approach is a great initiative and primarily about policy matters. But does policy matter anymore? We live in a fast moving transactional world in which governments act less according to preordained policy and more according to immediate opportunity. We can see this tendency most obviously in the recent US election where the sitting president did not even try to present coherent policies in such important fields as health or defense yet was almost re-elected. Similarly, in Australia, there are many governmental stances on climate change, but we still lack the coherence of policy-driven action. So I conclude, strong policy may now be less wanted, but is actually more needed than ever. Second, the wonderfully wide ambit of these five reports. Kate has talked about the report on benefits, the one coming from Middle Australia interviews, and policy drivers, so I won't touch on them again. But the first and the last reports are big picture reports. They're often statistical, and they're trying to clear up major areas of current misunderstanding, such as is government spending more or less on arts and culture than it was a decade ago? And the answer to that is states, territories, and especially local governments have been spending more but the Commonwealth proportionately less. So I ask, are we always directing our lobbying to the right place? Secondly, the question, is arts and culture the same as the creative economy? And an answer to that is no. Arts and culture by various definitions are around about 10 to 15% of Um, Malcolm, I think you're frozen. Is everybody else getting that response? Yeah, okay. So, um, yes, you might want to turn off your camera, Malcolm. Um, I can't, so... Malcolm, do you want to say something so we can see if we can hear you, if not see you? Okay, I don't think we have this coming up. But just bear with us. We have a technical hitch. Um, Joy, I think we'll carry on. Malcolm's no, out of the session. No problem. Okay, all right. So. All right, so it looks like Malcolm will have to return to us. Um, what, what we might do then is, um, uh, Ros, I think um, you've got a film for us. Is that right, a three minute film? No, we don't, all right, that's okay. I think we should kick into discussion, uh, to be honest. Um, and actually, Malcolm made a very interesting opening remark um, rather challenging to us about whether policy really matters. I mean, we all know policy matters. It's essential. It's in the, it's needed. It's part of the fabric of you know democratic processes. But but is it all too easy for government to discard policy and um, you know just not take it on board uh, as as we hope they sh they should. I think Francesca used the word good policies enabler or enabler. Um, do you want to say a little bit more about that? I mean, from, from your perspective, is, is, uh, is that, is that um, the way we should be going to see it as an enabling force? Yeah, sure. I, th I think um, certainly policy is a sign of all hands on deck. And I think that that's, something that we don't see very often. And we heard Kate refer to the sports uh, 2030 plan. I think um, policies should underpin plans and strategies and need to be flexible enough 
to give people an understanding of the what we're all striving for and without them you're just a walking ticks box or you're talking to yourselves and I often find that people who are like-minded don't need policies it's people who are outside the camp that benefit from policies and when you think that the arts can intersect successfully with um, the visitor economy, the economies in general, community connection, mental health, etc. An underlining base policy would enable people from different areas of, say, government, but it's not just government, to know how to access the arts. And that's what I think is missing. Um, policy also, contemporary policy, needs to go across private, not for profit, and the public sector. And it's not just race, creed and colour anymore. It's actually really, what are we trying to do? What are we all trying to do? Mm. And that's where I think policy comes in. Mm. Thank you, Francesca. Yeah, just anyone, um, Kate, you were talking a bit about the um, parliamentary inquiry and I guess the contribution to that. So we're seeing that in a way as a contribution to policy or hopefully some policy formation. Um, and you're quite optimistic in your experience of that. Um, it's all too easy for governments, though, to, I guess, Malcolm's point was to abandon policy, right, to walk away from it and be opportunistic, as we know governments can be. Um, what was it about the inquiry particularly that perhaps um, restored or, you know, uh, you know, strengthened your faith in a policy, the policy formation potential? Well, so I think the thing that I found really hopeful about that parliamentary inquiry experience was the sense of non-partisan conversation. I think the, and as Francesca has really referred there, that this uh, is a conversation that needs to speak, not necessarily to those who already believe in the value and relevance, uh, but those who don't necessarily, or who are curious and want a way in to understanding this space. So, that's why I think the Sports 2030 is a really excellent model for us to be looking at because it does such a great job of spanning uh, quite specialist interests like elite athletes through to the importance of community participation right across the country, the relevance of those uh, of that participation to arts, to wellbeing and health, the entrepreneurial and corporate element of a sport within Australia, the fact that this is a business, it's the best model I've seen that manages to capture that broad community relevance, that broad industry relevance, and that broad public value relevance in a way that that is, is well informed, that is based on good conversations with those different stakeholders and brings it into a set of principles. And, and as Francesca says, gives a sense of what we're trying to do here. And when I say we, I mean everyone. I don't just mean people within um, the believers. Mm, yeah, okay, thanks, And articul articulates what it is that is trying to be done. And yeah. Um, I, I think, I think Ruby, you would use the word responsibility at, at some point throughout your talk. And I guess that's a key word, right? I mean, who has responsibility, who's taking responsibility? Um, do you want to say a little bit more about that? I mean, and, and in terms of, you know, cutting through with, with policy, um, who should take responsibility in, an un, I, I guess, a nonpartisan way? Look, I, I might add to, to the comments that um, uh, it, there, there is no doubt that Australia has a, an extraordinary cultural architecture. Um, mm. When you think across the nation of the, the galleries and the museums and the libraries and the concert halls and theatres and the cultural uh, infrastructure that, that exists, the, the subsidised and commercial sector, uh, the policies that reside within capital cities, metropolitan councils, regional councils, states and, and uh, within the uh, uh, various uh, Commonwealth government um, institutions, um, the philanthropic architecture that exists, the small to medium sector, uh, other, other companies. There's a very rich cultural architecture. I think what we're what we're really emphasising is that there is there's no cohesive um, uh, national cultural policy set of settings that actually creates a cohesion for all of this uh, activity. Um, 
And, and without it, we seem to sort of lack a, a cultural confidence in the way in which we assert ourselves to ourselves. Um, uh, that bit of a sense of disbelief that despite all of this architecture that's existed and that's existed for such a, such a long time, um, we can't seem to, to project ourselves in a way that actually acknowledges the significance that culture and arts play in the lives of, of everyday Australians. Um, so so that, that's the project that we're after, I think. Mm, thank you, Rupert. Look, um, I think we've got Malcolm back. Malcolm, are you back in verbal and visual? I, I hope so. Good. Well, well, you are here. So um, do you want to then pick up Malcolm on where you left off and we'll hold off the discussion until you finish? Great. I'm sorry about that. Uh, they're filling in Lake Burley Griffin just outside my apartment and it's been creating some havoc for us today. Um, I've just got two minutes to go. Um, I was um, talking about the fact that uh, you have a central placement of the, of the uh, arts and culture areas within a broader and in tandem with the creative industries in most economic models now. And I was saying that it's to my mind a great failure of us in Australia that we haven't yet learned how to incentivize our self-evident creative potential uh, as we see in the huge imbalance of trade that we currently have. And it disappoints me in this age of trying to recover from COVID that we're hearing a lot about advancing Australian manufacturing and construction, but only hearing about, quote, trying to preserve some of our cultural infrastructure. I don't think that's okay. Um, another observation I'd make is that these various studies of a new approach, you see in them how the creative economy doesn't have a one shared economic model, and hence it lacks a sense of common economic cause. Um, some corners are fully commercial, others highly government subsidized, and too many sit insecurely in the middle. And I suggest that countries like Korea, I mean South Korea, please, or Denmark, with, have, with their relatively well-balanced terms of creative trade, present more mature models of how we might one way be. And that brought me to my last point, and Rupert has already said this, it is cultural confidence. We need to move on from John Curtin in 1942. In cultural battles, as well as in military, we can no longer look to Britain or America for our salvation. Almost by default in 2020, Australia is becoming a G12 kind of middle power, but still lacking the political, economic and cultural confidence to match that status. It's time we stopped behaving like a cultural spin-off from somewhere else and accepted the more major roles many others in the world would happily see us take in these very troubled times. Thanks, Joy. Thanks, Malcolm, for that. And um, we did actually pick up the conversation while um, you were out of, out of focus or out of picture um, about policy and your opening remarks about whether policy still matters. Um, and a number of the panelists picked that up. Uh, I, guess, I guess one of the interesting areas here that one of our um, uh, participants has asked here is about how do you get cut through? Now, each of you have sort of implied that uh, in your presentations, but you know, how do you get cut through uh, in policy? Um, how, would you, how would each of you answer that? I'll throw first to Ros, because we haven't had, uh, heard from you yet, Ros, in the discussion. Excellent, thanks for that. Okay. <laughs> um, I think, for us, um, a cut through is um, is coming from a place of, of authentic, genuine response. Um, and the way that we've been talking about engagement at a policy level um, has been through twofold, really. Firstly, um, through like granular case studies that really show what's happening on the ground, drilling down to a very small experience that can demonstrate an effect on, and then from that can then de demonstrate a need and importantly can then provide an answer. So for us, the, we found the successes or the ways we've been trying to get cut through and to be able to have 
doors opening and to have conversations and particularly with um, the 10 million dollar recovery boost was to be able to say these are the issues this is what's happening these are the needs and these are the answers and the solutions that can address these needs and then be able to follow that through with a way to basically map that need map those demands and then evaluate that response to go again um, so then you go again back in and say well that you know this has been this has addressed this but the there's multiple other factors that we need to work through um, i also think it's really really important in the language that we use and that our language is inclusive and accessible and that our language is talking across policy portfolios, because I think, I can't remember which colleague here spoke about the way we talk to ourselves. And it's really important that we do talk to ourselves because we support one another, but we need to talk outside of that. And we need to talk across those policy platforms. We need to talk tourism, we need to talk construction, we need to talk trade and investment, and we need to be able to use those languages to connect an arts and creative industry language. Um, and to have a really broad narrative, but at the same time, always come back to, from an artist point of view, from an arts organisation point of view, from a community point of view, this is the effect on the ground. Okay, would you like to um, follow up on that? I'll just grab a, a, a reflection from everyone on this question of cutting through. Sure, uh, Ros has given you a very, considered an elegant answer, I'm going to give you a considered but less elegant answer, the vomit principle. Is if you have repeated, this is of course a, 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 bit, a, a kind of term that politicians um, use to talk about needing to speak so often. When you, when you have spoken about something and said it so many times that you feel like you will vomit if you have to say it again, that is the moment when you start to get cut through with the public. And I think uh, it's a useful frame of reference for thinking about this space, that it's not about saying things once. It's not about saying things once well. It's about saying things so many times well and in so many different ways with understanding the relevance of who you're speaking to, saying it so many times that you think you will vomit and when you get to that point, that is when you start to get traction. Oh, thank you, Kate. Well, that, <laughs> that's, uh, that, that'll make an interesting manual uh, uh, for cut through policy. Okay, I'll, I'll throw it to Rupert. Um, in your experience, Rupert, what would you say to that uh, question? Look, maybe a, a couple of things, um, Joy. Um, the, the first is, I think that the breakthrough element um, of a new approaches work in the middle Australia area is that there, there actually is an enthusiastic core of middle Australians that are actually very devoted to arts and culture mm. and completely appreciate and get what uh, that does in their, in their lives. Um, um, uh, somehow animating that group more than they presently are to, to, to speak more, more broadly in the public domain about how important arts and culture are, I think is a is, is a key element of breakthrough. But, but I, I'd have to say two other things. The, the architecture of the meeting of cultural ministers has actually been really important. It probably hasn't been exploited sufficiently for, for what it's been. And I mean, I like to think that the model of national cabinet actually um, you know, came from the idea of, uh, of, of MCM. That's been a, a very good uh, forum. And to, to maintain that in, in, uh, in a really meaningful way uh, through the uh, some of the reforms that are going on with National Cabinet right now is going to be really important. And, and the, the last comment I'd make is that generally, uh, pat particularly in, in the arts, um, the response to inquiries has actually generally been very strong with government. So um, uh, I think that the fact that this particular inquiry that's underway now has, has had so many submissions is actually very important. And, and like Kate, I think, you know, hopefully quite promising. Governments tend in this space to respond quite well. So, you know, like it or not, the MPA framework that came out of that inquiry, uh, the Newton inquiry over 20 years ago, the, the visual arts and, and craft strategy, um, uh, some of these other initiatives that have, have, have really brought three tiers of government together in a very meaningful way and created frameworks is, is one of the ways to sort of move, move these discussions forward. Mm, great, thank you, Rupert. Um, 
Okay, Francesca and then Malcolm on this question of cutting through. Um, I think uh, Roz mentioned before about authenticity and I believe that really if policy doesn't speak for the people um, who are involved, all of the stakeholders, then it's you're not going to get any cut through at all. Sometimes I believe there's a fine line between campaign and cut through and a good slogan can be the basis of a good policy. But um, certainly I, th I think that Malcolm made a good point before about, um, you know, local government's investment in the arts and where do we put our advocacy efforts? And I think that that's part of where policy comes from is from the grassroots level. And certainly the slam rally in Melbourne, which was put together to protect live music, then generated a number of different uh, policy areas. And there was funding commitment as well as a long-term view that I think we could learn from, but it certainly was from a grassroots level um, that I, that's the reason I refer to it. Yeah, great. Thank you, Francesca. And uh, Malcolm, reflections on cutting through in policy. Uh, are you muted, Malcolm? I think you are. No, I'm There no, you go. I should be fine, thanks. Yes. Um, I think uh, looking at the broadest economic picture as people in Canberra will want to do, arts and culture is just too small, it's not getting the headlines. And it needs to form a common cause with the rest of the creative economy, which is now a term in common parlance. It's a part of the entire nature of the, of the country's GDP. To give an example, arts and culture have about 125,000 employees. There are some 850,000 in the total creative space. By having that, that common cause, having those allies, being as big as some of the big players then, like agriculture, unfortunately not, perhaps not quite as big as mining yet, uh, there's, a, there's a place at the top table. And until we can forge those bigger alliances, which means speaking in different ways and learning some different advocacy skills, I suspect that it will be a very hard road to hoe. Thank you, Malcolm. I'm, I'm taking a few, um, please keep putting the questions in. Um, we're getting some tremendous questions here, um, which I'm throwing to the panel. Um, one of the questions is a really interesting one about the ANA evidence. And I suppose initially, Kate, I'll throw this to you, but the others obviously come in. Um, and it's about what um, did, or what does ANA evidence um, Base. What is uh, the A? What, what in the ANA reports um, has been generated that we didn't know before? And I suppose this is to you as well, Malcolm. But I, over to you, Kate, because you did address the reports in your talk. So, what, what what has come out of the reports that we didn't know before? So there is um, three things that I'll highlight there. Um, but I'll begin by saying uh, part of the role of those reports is to take the things that we may have known in very disparate places around the world in different disciplines and different locations with different perspectives and bring them into a place where it is accessible and usable for a much wider range of stakeholders. And so that's why I referred at the start to how those are being used, that this is, this is not just about new insights, it's about new audiences for those existing insights. That said, I'll highlight three things that we didn't know before. Uh, we didn't know uh, whether arts and cultural funding, so cultural funding by government, um, which is that key da data set, we didn't know in any kind of uh, clear way whether it was going up or down. And in fact, um, in my early, uh, the early time in this role, I thought surely that is an answer, that, that surely that's a question we know, whether cultural funding is going up or down. And whilst that data set is released every year, there wasn't at that point an analysis which allowed um, a meaningful answer to that question. So the uh, analysis in that first report has told us things that we didn't know, as well as bring a much wider audience for that material. The policy drivers work gave us a framework that we didn't have before. Of course, it draws on existing material, but it's 
brought it into a, uh, again, more accessible form that's more usable for a much wider range of stakeholders. The Middle Australia piece is really key in this. It's given us uh, a much a clear evidence base for the relevance of arts, culture and creativity in the lives of that particular cohort. And there's a range of um, different pieces of analysis in that fifth report, which are new as well. I'm going to finish in the same way that I started, that whilst there is an important focus on new insights, there's also a really important, I say critical uh, focus on new audiences for existing insights that may be well known, um, particularly within academic literature, but not known broadly in a whole range of the space of a whole range of stakeholders for whom that is very useful. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, I'll just ask Malcolm to come in there, but then I might take to go to the rest of the panel as well. Um, uh, Malcolm, did you have a comment about what you would identify as particularly striking in the ANA sort of reports that we didn't perhaps know about yeah. of and so on? Well, what, what did really surprise me was the trajectory of the different levels of government in the last 10 years. We talked about that a little already, but that also got us looking at the question, why do we think so much of government as being important in the total funding mix? Government is about a, a tenth of the, the total income that's coming into this sector. It's actually a very proud record of earning when you consider 90% is coming from somewhere else in arts and culture. So that was something big to learn and a useful advantage to trade perhaps in new alliances in, with new sectors. And I um, too found the Middle Australia report very interesting and uh, particularly interesting in terms of the words. The words art seems to have a very elitist um, conception in Australia almost a dirty word associated with the wrong kind of perhaps upmarket people. And culture was so positively used, but then when you listened closely, it was a very fuzzy in its concept. It cut a huge range from, you know, sausages at the local festival to, um, you know, um, carols in the park. Um, so we've got a lot to learn there about how we communicate. Um, and um, the last thing I just mentioned is the issue of how um, in policy terms, we're going to be recognizing that maybe federal and some state governments are sitting in a rather more distance um, stage from their local communities. The work being done by philanthropists and local government was quite incredible. Mm. It's actual on the ground mums and dads appreciating arts and culture. And in a way, it was as if some big estates and maybe the feds have become distribution agencies of money. Mm. Um, it's interesting to explain this rapid change that's occurred over the last decade. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, Francesca, I think you did mention briefly the, uh, some of the ANA material, just in useful, you know, it being useful to, to leverage and argue for policy, you know, directions. Do you want to say something about the ANA material and, and what might have been of surprise or um, new to you? Just to reinforce the point that was made around Middle Australia, because I think a lot of people in governments talk to Middle Australia, would like to appeal to Middle Australia, and certainly our advertising on TV and that sort of thing is Middle Australia. So for if there's some way that we can bolster um, the findings and also improve understanding of what arts and cultural creative industries actually is. I think that um, we can inform that ivory tower planning <laughs> that Malcolm referred to and actually go back to that grassroots authentic uh, policy making um, quite naturally. It has to come from the people. The people are saying they want it. So for me, what are we looking at? We're looking at what's the blocker. So are we just not very sexy? I think maybe that's got something to do with it. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Ros, I'll, I'll turn to you now. Um, any thoughts about ANA and its reports and what is uh, for you something new or different or, you know, a new take on an old theme? 
I think, I think what's um, incredibly useful with the suite of reports that are coming from ANA is that um, is the ability for others, um, both organisations or across the sector or from in the sector to use it as a communication tool. Um, so the reports themselves allow for like really hone in on definitions and provide then the industry with definitions that we can then all refer to. I do think that there has been some challenges across the sector with um, lots of us using very similar words and not necessarily meaning the same thing. Mm. Um, so with, there's a demystifying of language and there's a reframing of language that the reports are doing, which I think really helps us as a sector then be able to um, frame up a narrative and frame an economic argument and then frame a, a language argument or a narrative that we know then has a consistency and has a baseline that is coming from data that we can actually then quote from or can use. But it also then means it's not saying, uh, I, don't, I certainly don't read it as saying, this is what you have to say and this is how you're going to say it. It's a tool that allows us to be able to then reframe that language and be able to use um, and, and advocate within the, the, the data of the reports to our own sectors, to our own needs, to then be able to have our own conversations that speak to in our case, regional or remote. But there's a consistency then and a, and, a, and a clarity behind that narrative that allows everybody to be coming from the same place. Mm -hmm. And I actually think as a sector, there's, and I, I can't remember who spoke earlier, but someone did say that, you know, we've been quite extraordinary in using many, many words and, and or several words and meaning many, many things from them. And, and the, the clearer that we can become in those definitions um, that then can allow for both language and economic conversations, I think there's, a, there's, there's real merit in that tool. Great, thanks Roz. Um, and Rupert, lastly to you about um, a and in the reports. Yeah, look, I, the surprise to me, I think, has been just how rapidly the information in the five uh, reports has been sort of taken up um, across the sector, amongst artists and arts organisations, um, within the philanthropic uh, community, uh, and within government and hearing, um, you know, the three tiers of government for referring back to uh, to the evidence and, and to the language, as Rosa said, uh, within each of the reports. That's um, both been surprising, but of course, very, very pleasing. I, I suppose the singular um, uh, work in the reports that that, uh, that I've found interesting and, and come back to is just how, how competitive public funding is between capital city governments. Um, that uh, you know, local government is the surprise area for the, the way in which um, financial commitment to, to arts and culture has shifted in the last, uh, uh, particularly in the last decade. But a good deal of that is, uh, is capital city governments recognizing just how critical um, having great arts and cultural experiences within their respective cities actually is, how important it is to have thriving uh, art sectors, you know, great, cultural experience, but, but also in the support of individual artists. And, uh, um, you know, that's been, I think that's been one of the, um, uh, one of the surprises to see that sort of documented in an authoritative and meaningful way. Oh. Sorry, I was just going to, yep. So thank you, Rupert. Um, I was just saying this conversation has been very illuminating and, and gets to the heart of what we're talking about. And one of the common threads that you all raised was the need for a common national policy. Uh, this question is really interesting. And so it's a little bit of a, uh, a challenge to the panel. Is it wishful thinking aiming for a national arts and cultural policy that spans three tiers of government with agreed levels of investment, agreed targets, and agreed delivery mechanism. Um, so uh, I think we all agree that would be great, but um, to what extent do you think that is possible? Uh, so perhaps, um, Kate, I'll open to you. You're unmuted. I'll take Thanks, to you Joy. First. My simple answer is uh, we have a version of that in the Sports 2030. If we can get that sorted out, for that space, we can get it sorted out for this space. We've demonstrated this year that the three levels of government can work together. Um, we've got strong, um, many strong examples of that. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's wishful thinking. I think it's ambitious, and I am only interested in things that are ambitious. Okay, great. Thanks, Kate. Like, can I jump there as well? Yeah, yeah, no, um, please. I, I, I think it's essential. Yeah, Ross. Like, we have to. 
like it, it's it's not a question of of want it's a question of we absolutely have to it's essential and it's happening it's happening around us and um, it will and it's just about putting the framework to, to support that okay thank you um so um malcolm yes i'd like to throw in something here a little bit um deviant um national policy yes we need something that encompasses the entirety of the land but let's make sure it reflects the current configurations of federalism otherwise it's pushing in a way that isn't going to be well greeted especially if there's such good work done at local levels so it has to be something which recognizes difference and recognizes the different ways in which different states go so whether a national policy is one that is then regulated measured and funded by a national government is something that i would be questioning the good thing is that already the cultural and creative ministers have this national council a bit of a pre-runner as rupert said to the national cabinet and maybe through that it's possible still to reflect that lovely tapestry that we have in our federation great malcolm thank you francesca i don't think it's wishful at all and to put that in context, the ALGA national policy was challenging and it did go back and forward and it was uh, coming, you know, addressing a whole lot of people from different areas, but it was done. And I think that the arts associations, the peak arts associations around the country are incredibly adaptive and informed and have worked uh, together really well. And Australia is only 25 million people. I think that um, there's, you know, there's a, a critical imperative now for us to advance the nation's econ economic um, future. And really the creative economy is again and again showing itself to be critical to that. And uh, I think like Ros said, you know, it's now, we're doing it, it's done. It's just how do we convince others to sign it off? Thank you, Francesca. And Rupert. Oh, I think you muted. Yeah. Um, I think you muted, Rupert. Yeah, sorry, I okay. thought I'd come off. Um, no, look, I, I, I agree. It is an imperative uh, and it's not wishful thinking. Um, you know, when I consider what, what, what should we have learnt um, about Indigenous Australia, uh, it is that, uh, you know, for uh, over millennia, uh, disciplined leaders and thinkers debated and cultivated and charted and implemented really sophisticated notions and, and systems in enacting sort of cultural beliefs. Um, you know, that's, that's our inheritance. Um, um, that's the nation that we're fortunate uh, uh, to inhabit. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think there's, uh, uh, that's what we need to get back to, and you know, with a with a real sense of of belief and conviction. Thank you, thank you, Rupert. Um, I'm just going to couple a few questions here that overlap. One is about digital um, uh, digital access, equity and access. And Ros, you raised this question, so um, this has come out really of your the point you made about digital access. Um, but there are a few questions about digital inclusion, um, connectivity, and, and where you see that in terms of policy approach. And I'll, I'll ask the other panellists as well, but I thought we'd, I'd start with you because you specifically raised that very good point. Thank you, Joy. Um, yes, it is, um, I guess we've seen digital, connect, digital connectivity um, come to the forefront um, through COVID and there's and it's got a double-edged sword on one level we've seen regional and remote artists and organizations be um, having a more equal access to representation on panels such as these um, through being able to get to um, rehearsal studios and auditions that are online and that geographic divide hasn't been there and so we've seen far greater representation um, of, of artists and organizations across the digital platforms at the same time, we've also seen a huge, um, a, a non, -e non equal space where um, at digital dial up, access to um, connectivity, internet speeds, um, access to 
uh, infrastructure and resources, uh, devices, and, and all of the above not being again equally available to all. Um, and I think, you know, I know there's a lot of work going on around um, the MBN and digital connectivity in a national space. And I think the conversation needs to be um, multiple. It needs to be connectivity as far as to the provider. There needs to be a point of retail access to then the service that then connects that provider. Mm -hmm. There needs to be access to um, the to tablets and, and to the mechanisms to then activate that. And then there needs to be education and training platforms to then support that ongoing. And I think the other part in this policy space is that it's not just a policy conversation for now, it's ongoing and needs to be continually being refreshed and developed because what we're dealing with again is a really moving landscape where the digital world is, is actually moving faster than the policies beneath it. Um, and we need to look at how that we can do that and how then being based on whether you're in a Metro code one or in a really remote code seven, you have access to internet um, and reliable connectivity and you do have the same access um, to upload and download speeds. Mm. And talking to colleagues, it, you know, there is a financial component there and I, I could be getting a certain internet connection for 200% less than my colleague that is in Kananara who has to pay very different amounts for that um, access. So there's, there's multiple parts here. Um, and I think any digital strategy that we work to has to understand the basic um, mm. connectivity communication nuts and bolts before we then talk about the, the strategies the, of, of connection. Mm. Thanks, Ros. Does anyone want to add, I mean, I'll just open to the other panellists. Would you like to add further to this question, vital, fundamental question, Kate, over to you. Look, I think this is an excellent example of where we need strong, clear, strong, clear understanding that MBN is cultural infrastructure. We need, if we want a cultural democracy, if we want participation and contribution from across our country, uh, this, this is a key piece of cultural infrastructure. And that's why having arts and culture kind of shoved off to the side in its own place, rather than in a connected way and a cross portfolio way is, is a really a fundamental issue for our democracy. If we, if we take as a tenant that cultural participation and contribution is a key part of our democracy, then this is a key way that we do that. And the need for symmetrical uplink downlink is absolutely the best embodiment of this. Uh, the, there are situations where, of course, you can get lots of, lots of stuff sent to you, but you can't participate. You can't, if you have a, a non-symmetrical uplink downlink, the, your ability to contribute to that cultural conversation, uh, your capacity to contribute to that conversation mm -hmm. is inappropriately, um, removed so mm. it's a this is such a great example mm. of where this is not just a, a niche interest this is about participation right across the country thanks kate um look unless unless anyone's got any particular burning comment i might move it along mindful of the time and we have lots of fantastic questions um the next one is a sort of cluster of questions but it's one question, but there are a number of questions I think I can collapse into it. And that is more or less this question. Um, what really do you believe are the impediments to economic investment in arts, culture and creativity? Now, the question really is directed to ROS with a specific focus on rural, remote and regional. But some of the questions that follow actually relate, like, for example, what is the likelihood of bipartisan policy when each government will shelve the last government's policy? Um, can, uh, can there really be a triple helix kind of cooperation? So I suppose we're looking at impediments here, um, both uh, in the region and the rural, but, but more broadly, how would people identify impediments? What are the impediments that people see here to economic investment? Maybe I'll start with you, Malcolm, because you, you've focused a lot um, or you focused on economics and the economic side of the question. 
um, in the reports and in conversations. So and what are your thoughts about the impediments? Well, one impediment I'd like to um, raise is the obvious one of where do these artists come from? Because I see quite a problem in vocational education at the moment. Uh, and it runs over into university education too because of the fixation of universities with a particularly narrow conception of what research is and the importance of that to their funding. So until you can get the good investment in the education, either through some healing of um, vocational education or TAFE, or indeed recognising maybe this is an area which increasingly has to be entrusted to private providers, to run on private economic models, mm. I think we've got a bit of an impediment, which is in the, the training and therefore the artist pipeline. We have to do better than we've done in the last 15 or 20 years. So Malcolm, just quickly to, to extend that, just if I may slightly, because there is a question around that. Um, how do you think we get this university sector to accept it has a responsibility for vocational arts training? <laughs> um, we have to find some way to recognise there's not one model fits all in universities, and mm. that requires either some very brave vice chancellors mm. or us to recognise that the university's role is done through some kind of franchise arrangement, or you just recognise everything doesn't have to be done in a university, despite mm. just despite the word. Mm. Thanks, Malcolm. So just coming back to impediments, um, perhaps Francesca, I can throw it to you. What do you see as impediments to investment in culture, creativity? Um, we spoke about a lot of it before. Um, when we were talking about um, consistent messaging or you know, just the ability to speak uh, to the different parties that make the decisions, but also I think there's a lot to be said for future-focused leadership. And I'm not sure that going back, and this is something that was raised with regard to cultural infrastructure, is really where we want to go. And all the rhetoric around recovery is to getting it back. So I'm not quite sure why we'd want to do that when back wasn't necessarily a terrific place to be. But it is, you know, Australia is incredibly innovative and creative thinking is the basis for a lot of innovation. So if you go back to the fish traps of Badge Bim or to the incredible skin that's come um, produced out of Western Australia for burn victims, I mean, the creative thinking is not just artists sitting in a studio painting a picture. And I think we've got mm. to remove ourselves from that. And I was thinking before about gaming when you were talking about technology, this immersive creative space mm -hmm. that children no longer use the internet to just see things. They're mm. actually there with it. They're conversing and communicating mm. on every single level, whether they're watching a YouTube clip of a Californian, you know, teenager, it's mm. all in. Mm. So how are we going to move governments to stop them talking about construction and I only use that as a as a example mm. and to what actually is on the table if we could lead Asia Pacific in creative mm. thinking in both education and delivery wouldn't we be incredible sector leaders for this whole region I just think it's mm. possible Thank you, Francesca. So, uh, uh, Ros, did you want to say something particularly around the regional and area? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the biggest impediments is that we actually have to change the narrative. Like, it comes back down to our responsibility to change the narrative of, of what of arts and creativity or arts and cultural industries and we need to actually start to break down those walls. And so not, not therefore saying, the arts and culture is over here and it's snapped off and it's a nice to have, but at bad times, it's not necessary. To actually put it in that, in that narrative, it's embedded in absolutely every community, in every small hall, in every school, in every town, in every city. And it's connected in multiple across art form and across communities and across, um, across the sectors. And to then start to break down the walls that we put around arts and culture, and particularly around our venues, whether they're performing arts or visual arts, or whether there are small tall gatherings, and break down those physical walls and talk about the multi-dimensional way in which arts and culture connect to people and place. 
And then we can start to talk about how the cultural industries build vitality of regions and that extension of the physical place. And it comes down, it's a responsibility of, of us and our sector to change that narrative and to see that then an investment in arts and culture isn't solely an investment in arts and culture, it's invested in people, place, communities and experience. And how then do we, and, and when that's not there, we know it, we see it, we feel it. Mm -hmm. And to then be able to invest in, and it's, it's hard because we're saying invest in that feeling, but we're not saying that. We're saying invest mm -hmm. in this whole of ecosystem approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's down to, the, as I say, it's down to changing that narrative and therefore changing that investment um, approach that is I'm investing in X. Yes, you're investing in X, but A, B, C, D, E, F, and everything else in between comes with that. Mm, great. Thanks, Ros. Um, Kate and Rupert, did you want to make a comment about this challenges to investment? Look, uh, just a quick one. I'm I'm not sure that it's very helpful to um, to focus on the lack of bipartisanship. I think the um, you know my observation, particularly in the way in which the cultural infrastructure has has developed, is there's been actually a remarkable bipartisanship mm. um, across politics and uh, and the continuity that exists between. Between and across different uh, uh, different governments, um, I, I think that um, you know it really would behove that the sector to go in actually feeling confident uh, about asserting the strong bipartisanship that that has existed. Yes, of course there have been scuffles and there have been policy differences, but but broadly speaking, there's been strong bipartisanship, and and we should be sort of aiming our advocacy towards uh, wishing that to to continue. And continuing, I think, as Ros has just said, to to assert the, the centrality, importance in every community and in every place, um, that should be the focus. Thank you, Rupert, and and just quickly, Kate, if you could make a comment about that. I'm going to make a comment, which is each of my fellow panelists have answered <laughs> it so beautifully and from so many different aspects. I think all is covered. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, we have. Uh, two minutes left. Now, uh, in that two minutes, there is one last question I will ask um, from the um, from our panel from our uh, participants. Um, and if you could just answer quickly, so we can finish on time. The question is: It's a bit like a quiz almost, but it's an interesting question. If we did have a national cultural policy, uh, natural arts, culture, and creative plan, what would be your top? inclusion. So maybe I'll go um, I'll go to Kate, yes, in a word. No silver bullets, no picking winners. It's not about picking one thing. This is about recognising the connectivity, the ecology, the manifest ways of this. So I, my answer to the question is it's not the right question. Okay. Thanks. No, no, it's a good, uh, it's a great response. Thanks, Kate. Uh, I'll, I'll perhaps go to Roz then. Sorry, finding the mute. Um, inclusion. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Francesca. I'm going to jump in because I was going to say inclusion too. All right. To inclusion. Every, everything and everyone and every business level, every, everything. Beautiful. Rupert. Yeah, I think I to ha hear many people say in my community, I have an opportunity to fully participate in the cultural life of this nation. Mm. Uh, and Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm's unfortunately dropped out again, Joy. All right, that's okay. Malcolm's not with us, but Rupert, that's a great moment, I think, and all of you on which to end this fantastic session, this great discussion on the inclusion and community. I think that's a magnificent note on which to end. Um, I wish to thank all our panelists. Thank you very much for a lively, engaging and very, very illuminating and stimulating discussion to the, our participants. Thank you for your questions. We didn't get through them all, but I hope that the ones we did get through, you, uh, you uh, are enriched by this discussion and um, moving forward that you've come away uh, illuminated um, and um, energized with the discussion we've had today. So it just leaves me now to thank you all. Thank our panelists once again, have a great afternoon and I hope you can join us tomorrow for more of a new approach and uh, discussions around culture and creativity.
Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Sir.